Hello. Hello, and welcome to Boosting Member Motivation, a webinar for leaders of the AmeriCorps VISTA program. From time to time, we can all use a little boost to help keep us motivated to work on our assignments, and VISTA leaders are well positioned to support motivation among members on their teams. I'm your host, Bethany Dusablin, a Senior Program Advisor and Instructional Designer at Education Northwest, one of AmeriCorps' partners. Our, presenters, our presenter is Andy King, a Senior Training Specialist at AmeriCorps VISTA Headquarters. Andy plays a large role in supporting VISTA leaders, not only through this monthly webinar series, but also through his work on VISTA leader orientation and the VISTA campus. We'll also be hearing from a guest speaker who is one of your VISTA leader colleagues, Shannon Tucker, who serves as a VISTA leader for the Ben D. Johnson Educational Center in North Louisiana. Now I'll turn it over to Andy to get us started. Thank you, Bethany. I'm excited to be here. Motivation is something I hear about from time to time in different ways from uh, VISTA leaders, certainly, but also from supervisors and from members themselves. Uh, it's a big topic, so we'll take just a narrow slice of the subject, um, and I'm going to invite you to share your thoughts and experiences in a few different areas along the way. I'm also excited that Shannon has joined us to share some of her ideas and experiences on how she's been successful in supporting her members in staying motivated. So what are we going to cover today? Let's look at our discussion items. First, we will define motivation and we'll look at the key factors that contribute to demotivation. Next, we'll examine a model that identifies what motivates people intrinsically, and we'll talk about what that looks like. And finally, we'll identify ways to help members sustain their motivation. And our guest speaker, Shannon, is going to help out with that. All right, so let's begin with the definition so we have a common understanding of what we're talking about. Um, what do we mean by motivation? At its most basic, motivation is what causes us to act. It's the why behind human behavior. But where does it come from? Where do we get our motivation? The impetus to act can come from external sources, like a paycheck or a punishment. Um, and these are often referred to as extrinsic motivators or incentives and disincentives. Research uh, from an author named Daniel Pink, whose framework we're going to look at in this session, uh, his research says that extrinsic rewards can be effective for repetitive tasks or those things that depend on following an existing formula. But for things that demand flexible problem solving, inventiveness, or conceptual understanding, he says that extrinsic rewards don't work and in fact, they can even be detrimental to someone's future behavior. So for our conversation, we'll be focusing on the drive that comes from within us, what is often called intrinsic motivation. And with intrinsic motivation, the behavior or its result is often its own reward. As you might have discovered, the types of activities VISTA members perform, things like problem solving, systems development, relationship building, uh, these are the kinds of behaviors driven by intrinsic motivation. And conversely, they don't really benefit from those extrinsic rewards. Many members are drawn to the meaningful mission-driven work of VISTA, and they walk in the door with strong intrinsic motivation. Um, and as Pink predicted, those external rewards do little to sustain the work of VISTA. But leaders can support and cultivate intrinsic determination within their individual members. There are a few more points about intrinsic motivation uh, besides the fact just that it comes from within. Uh, first, we are intrinsically motivated to do something if we simply enjoy that activity or if we see it as an option uh, for growth or an opportunity to learn or to get good at something. Whether it's practicing the piano or solving the Wordle puzzle because you like that challenge the way I do, uh, performing a behavior itself is a chance to improve. If a person is doing something they find rewarding, interesting, or challenging, 
they're more likely to come up with new ideas and creative solutions uh, connected with it. And intrinsic motivation can also be linked to a uh, positive attitude and a higher inner desire to perform and achieve. And think about it, when new members join your team, they often start out with lots of determination and they're ready to put their skills to use. And finally, it's often the intrinsic motivation that keeps people going and keeps them satisfied with their work for a longer period of time, including when they run into challenges along the way. So with that background on motivation, let's look at what can challenge or undermine it. So this may be familiar to you. Um, it's a graphic that, while it's not necessarily uh, you know, an exact roadmap for every member, it illustrates that the typical service experience includes some ups and downs. The good news is that even if a dip happens, things don't have to continue in a downslide. Before we go on, I want to give you your first opportunity to join the conversation, be part of the discussion. All right, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, so take a moment and think about your own team, your own site, and your own members. What are some reasons that your members lose their motivation? So that everyone can see your response, please be sure to send to everyone. A lot, a lots of lack of engagement, lack of challenge, um, some some financial stress, personal things that are coming up, not feeling supported, some mention of uh, leadership, uh, lack of leadership support. Um, what else? What else, what stuck out for you, Andy? There's a lot of great responses in the chat. Yeah, agreed. I, th I think there are, and I, th I think there are some patterns um, showing up here. You talked about uh, support, um, you know, whether that's financial or, or supervision or direction, um, and uh, some other words that we're going to see come up in just a minute, things like autonomy um, and challenge. So um, great work on this. Uh, uh, you all already um, have a good handle on what some of these uh, reasons are. So we're going to take a look at um, some uh, more structured uh, look at, at some of the reasons that people get demotivated and what we can do about it. So um, as I said, uh, what you've all just been responding really align with some of the key reasons for uh, that come from research um, on employees about why they become uh, demotivated. Um, the psychologists often point to these uh, elements. The first, as several of you said, is lack of direction that can leave a person unsure of their responsibilities or goals. And lack of resources, meaning tools, budget, or other kinds of support, can leave a person unable to accomplish those tasks. And as you can imagine, it can be really demotivating to feel like you're on your own and that no one is willing to help. Lack of knowledge about how to accomplish a key task can really take the wind out of your sails. And if the workplace culture doesn't encourage asking questions, then an individual might suffer in silence um, or become overwhelmed by all the things that they need to learn. Some of you mentioned lack of respect. Um, we'd add to that uh, dignity. Um, these are more of a personal affront so if a member's ideas are not considered or if they're not even taken seriously um, you know, in the workplace, uh, or if their presence on the project doesn't seem to be valued, um, any of that can be demotivating. Uh, several of you also mentioned engagement. Um, and by lack of engagement here, um, we're talking about that the, the individual, the member, does not really have an opportunity 
to engage meaningfully in the project or in their work or in the organization. Also related to this is being able to engage the right amount, right, with a work-life balance, um, because being overworked or overstressed can lead to burnout. And finally, the last reason uh, we'll look at is a lack of connection um, or a sense of belonging. As humans, you're probably aware, uh, we all have a strong drive for at least a few positive and lasting interpersonal relationships. So if you're in a workplace and you're feeling excluded, um, that can really cause you to, you know, be less motivated to give effort, you know, to, to, you're going to be willing to do less for the team um, and contribute less to the overall work. Uh, likewise, feeling isolated can be really demotivating. So that's a long list of not so encouraging uh, situations, um, but let's see where this might lead. So I've gotten some questions from leaders recently about burnout among members um, and how to prevent it. So I thought I would include this bit of information here. Burnout itself is a very specific condition um, that some people may experience, and it does have a connection to motivation. So first, let's define it. Um, as you can see there on the screen, burnout is a reaction to prolonged or chronic job stress. And it's characterized by three main dimensions. Exhaustion, which can be physical, mental, and or emotional. Cynicism, or you know, not liking your job anymore, not being happy or pleased about anything, um, or having a negative feeling overall. And then third, feelings of reduced professional ability, right? Or feeling less capable at work. So what are some of the common causes of burnout? Well, this list here, uh, again, comes from psychologists. Uh, it should look familiar. It includes many of the things that you said just a few minutes ago that can demotivate someone. And the most common causes of burnout are unreasonable time pressure, lack of communication and support from a manager, lack of role clarity, unmanageable workload, and unfair treatment. We'll come back to this again a little later after we take a closer look at what is actually inside motivation. Okay, so we've spent some time defining motivation and covering the reasons that uh, you can get demotivated or burned out. So let's look a little more closely um, at a particular take on motivation. So a well-known motivation framework comes from uh, this guy named Daniel Pink. I mentioned him a minute ago. And a book that he wrote called Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. And in it, he puts forth a framework with a neuroscience point of view that focuses on enabling people to become intrinsically motivated. And in the book, he talks about how there are three main elements that people look for in work and in life autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is defined as the urge to direct our own lives. We're generally more motivated to do things the way we like, right? Bringing our own ideas to the table in a meaningful way. So when we act on our motivation for autonomy, we are directing our lives in terms of time, technique, team, and task. And, uh, and Pink goes into all of those in a lot of detail in his book. Um, but, but all of those mean that we have the freedom to set our own time frame for doing the work, that we decide the best approach, uh, we work with others in ways that support us, and that we can break the overall job into tasks that make sense for us. So autonomy is essentially self-direction. The second area is what Pink calls mastery, and this is learning or extending and expanding our abilities and continually improving our skills at doing something that matters to us. When we feel like we're engaging the right competencies and we're doing the right type of work, we perform better. And when we get the right support, we're really self-motivated. When we can act on our motivation for mastery, we get better at doing the things that we care about. 
setting goals for ourselves related to attaining mastery is often positive, fulfilling, and healthy for us. And the third aspect is purpose. So purpose answers the questions our brains often ask. Why am I doing this? Does what I'm doing matter? What's the meaning? So this is our desire to do better by ourselves and our world through some meaningful endeavor. When we're motivated by purpose, we do what we do in the service of something larger than ourselves. And I think that should sound familiar to everybody here. And in Pink's model here, tasks or activities that fall in the area where all three aspects overlap, those things are able to support and nourish all of our intrinsic motivation areas. And so work that allows us to pursue autonomy, mastery, and purpose is generally the most satisfying and meaningful work, and it tends to be what we're most motivated to do. So you'll recall that autonomy, mastery, and purpose are aspects of intrinsic motivation. These are drivers that reside within us and that cause us to act in certain ways. Daniel Pink and others believe that while it's very difficult to insert motivation into someone who truly has none of their own, there are some things that can affect the intrinsic motivation that individuals have. There are ways to support intrinsic motivation as well as ways to undermine it. To think back to our chat activity earlier, we had no trouble identifying reasons that people become demotivated. As leaders, we want to avoid those for sure, but are there other things we can do to actively support motivation, to encourage and cultivate it? So let's see if there are specific ways to support each of the three aspects of intrinsic motivation. Um, Pink and others have identified approaches that can cultivate motivation in employees. Let's take a look uh, at those with an eye towards how leaders can support or boost motivation in their VISTA members. First, let's look at things you can do to support and encourage autonomy among your members. First is orient. Um, this can begin the day your members start serving by orienting them to their identity as an AmeriCorps member, as well as to the team and their role on it. Um, you can share site norms, which uh, sets them up for success and gives them the foundation they need in order to self-direct. Through orientation to the team, you can also build in a sense of belonging that can be essential to staying motivated. Creating opportunities for involvement and input is an important way to support autonomy. Being able to give input can be really empowering for individuals. Members should have input into how they accomplish their VAT activities, for instance, by deciding specific sub-activities that will help them reach the larger goal. Another area for member input and involvement is in identifying skills and knowledge that they want to build, and then using that information in creating their own professional development plan. Related to input is ownership. You can support autonomy by increasing members' ownership in a project by empowering them to make appropriate decisions. Ensure your member knows what needs to be accomplished, you know, the what, but let them decide the how. When people know that they have a direct impact, they're likely to feel more ownership and responsibility for the outcome. Uh, with solution generation, you can approach a conversations where you ask your members to talk about what they're working on and if they're having any challenges. And you can help them to identify potential solutions that they could come up with, right? Trying to draw the solutions out of them. Be a thought partner and a coach around challenges as well as solutions. And finally is trust. It's likely that many of your members have some self-direction, but it's useful only if you trust them to use it, right? To allow them to take something, make it their own, and then run with it. Trust is key to autonomy because your members need to be able to tap into self-directedness and feel like they're allowed to actually contribute. 
So that's a look at just the first area of motivation, autonomy. Before we go on, I want to invite one of your colleagues to share what she's doing in her project to support and encourage autonomy among the members there. I'm happy to introduce Shannon Tucker, who is serving as a leader at the Ben D. Johnson Educational Center in Natchitoches, Louisiana. This is Shannon's third year serving with VISTA, all of those years serving at the BDJ Center. The center's mission is to build community in Natchitoches and give access to social and economic success to all its residents. Their primary program is a youth workforce program preparing 17 to 24 year olds with life skills and hands-on job training. In addition to her VISTA service, Shannon is pursuing a master's in environmental law. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you, Bethany. I'm excited to share a few of the things that we do at my project location and to help serve and support autonomy in our members. I have two tips to share relating to autonomy. The first is a small philosophy, a small work philosophy that has made a large impact on me. When I started my first VISTA year, my boss said to me, don't waste time. Sounds straightforward, right? I have had other bosses say things like this before. This time, however, it felt a little different. My boss used this philosophy of don't waste time very broadly. She didn't want her time wasted, of course. However, she didn't want to waste other people's time either. I quickly realized that she applied this concept to almost any situation. This included research, event planning, and even marketing. Her real point, though, was that what are we spending our time on and what are we asking others to spend their time on? That was the real key. More importantly, she was giving me the freedom to manage my own time while reminding me that I have the responsibility to manage it well. Time is something we spend. We use it up. It's a consumable resource. In science, we call this the limiting factor, the item in the shortest supply. This philosophy builds autonomy for VISTA members because it is a quick and simple lens anyone can use to streamline their processes, quickly prioritize their tasks, and communicate effectively and efficiently. As VISTAs, we get a year of service, one year to accomplish our VADs. This time can disappear in the blink of an eye. We want to be sure that we manage and spend our time wisely. My second tip for autonomy, and this one is something that AmeriCorps already encourages and Andy already talked about a little bit, uh, is creating a work plan from the VAD. I cannot stress how useful this process can be when a new VISTA member starts at the BDJ Center. I make sure that we create their work plan together. We dissect their VAD, and with the help of a calendar, start to map out their year, turning those large concepts in the VAD and those big categories into actionable tasks. I feel that this step is essential in the individual's autonomy for many reasons. This process helps the member understand the VAD, the tasks, and the timeline that they will be working with. This initial time investment builds some professional comfort between you and the new member. It gives a chance for each of you to understand each other's communication styles and arms the member with the confidence to make proposals about the work plan or to raise questions about things that aren't clear. This also allows the both of you to talk at the beginning about the end, the end of service transition. I have seen VISTAs do a bunch of great work and then reach the end of service and have no plan for how to turn all of that information that they have gathered and connections they have built over to the organization. 
I find if this step is planned at the beginning, it makes a great difference across the year of service. This, the concepts of capacity building and sustainability that we talk about so much in AmeriCorps uh, make even more sense when the plan to, to transition the information is built right into the work plan from the start. Great. Thank you, Shannon, for sharing those helpful tips. Um, we'll have a chance to hear from you again soon. Now let's look at some ways to encourage mastery related motivation. So again, here are some things you can do as a VISTA leader. The opportunity to grow is inherent in working towards mastery. So encouraging and providing professional development for your team reinforces this aspect. For many people, Learning new things is really motivating in itself, right? Some members may need a little more guidance, so mentoring them on those growth areas can lead to advancement. Leaders, as you know, are often tasked with providing training and team trainings can build individual capacity as well as the ability to function together as a team. A different approach to supporting mastery is to highlight and celebrate accomplishments along the way. This could be encouraging the person um, who accomplished it, of course, but it also can be inspirational for the whole team. When they see the collective achievement and genuine acknowledgement, it builds a team culture of appreciation and that supports motivation. Recognition can take many forms, of course. What's important is that it's genuine. Encourage your VISTAs to identify their strengths and then apply them to their service. There are assessments your members can use, of course, or you could get to know your members uh, individually and see where their strengths lie. And then encourage them to build on those strengths rather than trying to focus on building up their weaknesses. And if somebody is doing great work, don't just stop with the acknowledgement. Lay out the next level challenge for them to meet. Yeah, that'll give them the chance to learn new skills while strengthening the ones that they've already developed, and it prevents boredom by letting them take on new tasks, which can really keep things interesting. Learning by doing is a great way to encourage mastery. And finally, another way to build mastery is to ask members to teach others or to share their expertise with the team. This could take the form of leading a mini teach on a topic, you know, having to teach others is a great way to reinforce and elevate your own knowledge and skill, and it gives a chance to actively engage at another level. All right, so that's it for mastery. Let's hear from Shannon again with an example from her experience. Thank you, Andy. Uh, my tip for mastery may require some discussion with your VISTA supervisor or other admin or whatever approval entities you have at your service location. To support mastery in VISTAs, we need to invest in their training. VISTAs at the BDJ Center can attend workshops and webinars with the Community Development Works Organization, which is a program of the Rapids Foundation of Central Louisiana. They have a program uh, that delivers workshops and webinars uh, of nonprofit startup, staff development, grant writing, and marketing. There are even board builders and exec builder programs for staff members and management. I have taken the grant writing series and it has been a great reference for me. Uh, we just onboarded a new uh, grants coordinator VISTA on the 14th. And she's about to take that same uh, grant writing series through the Community Development Works. And she and I will be able to communicate very easily because we'll both have experienced the same training. So that consistency helps to, helps to build a smooth road for communication. Uh, when communicating, we will understand the same terms, steps and processes. Uh, consistent training through these workshops and webinars and other 
resources that we've found have been a great help. Uh, this one is a local resource uh, for people in, in my area in the central Louisiana area, but look in your local area and check and see if there's any foundations or organizations or groups that do some kind of nonprofit workshops, webinars, things like this, and similar types of offerings. Some other resources you should investigate include local colleges, community colleges, universities. If you have one of these in your area, go and talk to the professors, ask them if they're willing to devote a little bit of time uh, either to give some tips or to provide some editing on documents or even some instructional meetings with a little more uh, time and a little more meat. Uh, reach out to retired instructors too. They, they have a little bit more time uh, and they could add to the training. They may be willing to volunteer their time on a pretty regular basis. Uh, Another option, if the board members for your organization are active at your service location, or they participate in any of the uh, daily activities or anything like that, if they're accessible, ask for resources, connections to contacts, and any training information that they might know of. Explain that you're trying to provide some additional support training for your VISTA members. Some of our board members are professors at our local university and they are very committed to help however they can. Online resources can be another great budget friendly alternative, especially if you're trying to convince anybody that, that you need some more uh, resources. But be selective with these, as, as we all know things online can, can vary wildly between how useful they can really be. Uh, some good online resources that I've used, Skillshare is excellent. Uh, that's an incredible resource with thousands of lessons and on so many different topics. Uh, another online resource, of course, is YouTube. We, I'm sure you're already YouTubing how to how to do all kinds of things. Uh, this is really great for uh, training to use a new system, especially if the company that provides that system releases instructional videos about it. Uh, I want to mention a couple of other resources that are listed in the back of the packet. First, I recommend Bloomerang, which is a CRM database. Uh, the Bloomerang uh, organization, they have their own YouTube channel and they provide all kinds of webinars and instructional videos on how to use Bloomerang and how to set it up best because it's very customizable. So it's great having that as a resource. Uh, and they also uh, do release a bunch of just nonprofit related information. So anytime that they have anything interesting to share. That's usually very useful. Uh, lastly, there is a, a former Microsoft employee named Kevin Stratvert. He's also on YouTube. He makes helpful videos about using the Microsoft Word applications. So WordPerfect, PowerPoint, Excel, all of those. Uh, I've used a combination of all of these both for my own training, as well as for new VISTA members, I recruit any certificates or credits earned from any of these uh, workshops or training as well. This can also be a great aid for the VISTA when describing their service year to show a future employer, this is a certificate that I got this is the training I received with that certificate, and this is what I built from that training. Uh, training classes and certificate programs are great for supporting mastery in your VISTAs because it gives them dependable, consistent, and professional information. They will recognize the investment in their professional development. 
Thank you, Shannon. So those are so many great ideas and very specific. So we've just posted something in the chat there too, so you can um, keep track of the ones that Shannon mentioned. Um, so we'd like to hear from you now. And um, I'm guessing you might have your own thoughts about what you could do with your members. And and maybe as, as uh, we were sharing stuff, you, some things came to mind. So as usual, uh, please, please uh, put your response in the chat and send to everyone um, and share what are some of the ways you can support mastery among your members. It looks like we have one in there right now with individual development planning or individual development plan, organizing a conference where former members can share the acquired skills, mm -hmm. people giving presentations. Got a recommendation from uh, Acumen Academy, providing free courses for teams and individuals and talking about taking social impact analysis is what um, when Sierra's doing. Uh, free continuing education classes from universities. Mm -hmm. Those free resources are great to know about. All right, Andy, what else? Uh, what, what, have you seen some great things in the chat so far? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there, are, there are many more, but um, YouTube, of course, has been mentioned a few times. Um, I also want to call out the, the um, Catalina's suggestion around um, bringing back alumni, you know, former members to come and share their acquired skills. That's great on so many levels because it's, it's practical, it's specific. You know, it's uh, former VISTAs teaching your current VISTAs, but it's also keeping your alumni engaged um, and bringing them back after they've maybe been out in the world for a bit and, and have some of their, uh, some new skill and experience to share. So love all of that. Um, uh, some other recommendations have come in here. Uh, I'll let you all read those and, and keep suggesting if you've got more. Um, but now I wanna move ahead and take a look at how we can support purpose. Um, of course, some of you have mentioned this. Uh, purpose is really central to what VISTA members do. And so finding ways to tap into their purpose is going to be essential at keeping your members motivated. Um, so we've got a few ideas here that you can do as a, in your role as a leader. Um, first is to put the mission and vision of the organization, as well as the VISTA project, front and center, and do it from the beginning, right, during uh, recruitment process and make it a focus of their orientation and onboarding. Um, keeping the purpose really central from the beginning can encourage long-term motivation, and it can provide a nice, reliable touchstone during those challenging times. If possible, give your members a chance to share with others their why for the project. You know, what is it that's very uh, connected to them individually? Um, along with letting them share their successes and recent accomplishments. Doing so actively engages the member while reminding them of their own inherent motivation for the work. You can also create a team culture that circles back to purpose and encourages members to take the time to connect back with why they serve in the position. What motivated them in the first place? How does their service fit into the bigger why of their life? And what do they see as their, uh, their life purpose? Creating a team culture where professional goal setting is shared and encouraged can lay a foundation that builds a connection to each individual member's purpose. Leaders can provide space for VISTAs to reflect on the things that give them purpose and then to articulate them to the team. Sometimes the simplest, the simple act of naming something can be really powerful. So figure out what uh, your members are passionate about and then find ways to infuse that into their service as well as to the team. Some people are motivated by social connection that also aligns with their life goals and life passions. And with so much disconnection in communities and made even worse by the pandemic, support Supporting and encouraging social connection among your members, specifically as it relates to their sense of purpose, 
can be a great way to nurture that side of them. All right, so I've covered a few ways that you can support and encourage motivation. Let's hear from Shannon again about something she does to support purpose among the members on her team. Shannon? Thanks, Andy. Uh, on that first day of service, there is a lot going on. So much to get through at the service location, getting settled in. The launching your Vista service webinar is no different, packed full of information. There is this other moment though, when we take our oath of service. The first moment possibly when we feel connected officially to AmeriCorps, our service location and the whole wide world of VISTAs, past, present, even swearing in with you at that moment and future. This moment for me at the start of my first year of service in 2019 felt important, so much so that I stood up at my laptop and held up my right hand like I was in the Girl Scouts. I spoke the oath out loud, feeling a sense of pride and excitement when I did the oath again for my second year, I again stood and recited the oath. This time I was working from home during 2020 lockdown. I needed that sense of connection even more. Now as a VISTA leader, I decided to record each VISTA's oath of service moment, just as I had done it, standing hand raised, reciting the oath along with the presenter. Looking back on this video can reinvigorate a member's sense of purpose. By capturing this moment and how they felt, it can help them remember the why that got them started. We join AmeriCorps for so many reasons, but primarily this is an emotional, personal decision, often to put other things on hold in our life so we can give of ourselves to others. Thank you. Once again, Shannon, these, um, these uh, examples you're sharing are really, really important. So thank you so much. Um, we'd like to give uh, the, the participants a chance to, to um, weigh in again. Um, and we, look at, we looked at purpose and heard some ways leaders can support it. And I'm guessing you may have your own ideas about what good with your members to support and encourage a sense of purpose. So take a moment and um, think about your own team and answer, uh, put in the chat, what are some of the other ways you can support purpose among your members? Got logo wear, that's great. Yeah, there was another vote for the uh, the, the the oath moment, right? Um, and just the meaning behind it, and and how powerful that can be. Yep, and here's a more um, showing videos of how communities from their service, so connecting people back to that, um, the the good they're doing and the impact they're having, being present and giving resources. You know, something the leaders do all the time, and um, that is really helpful to purpose um, and ensuring this ensuring visits are frequently thanked and reminded of their impact again. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing I saw come up in, in a few of these is connecting your members with other people, whether those are partners or other members or people in the community. So it's really that connection piece um, and building community within your team as well as the broader community. Um, is something that really is standing out here for me. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, thank you everyone for those. If you've got additional ideas, please keep them coming. Um, we love to, to see all of your suggestions. Okay, we're gonna pause and give you a chance to see how well you've been following along. Um, you should see the question pop up on your screen. So please take a moment to review the set of statements and identify which of the following is a way to support autonomy-based motivation. Um, so we're going to give you a few seconds to go ahead and um, answer that and, and submit your response.
Okay, we have uh, um, several people that answered. We'll give it a few more seconds, and then we will close the poll and um, and then just visit the correct answer. All right. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so the question was, which of the following is a way to support autonomy-based motivation for members? Okay, let's see. Let's go to the next slide. All right. And then, the, so the first group, um, the correct answer is C. So set a team goal and ask members to determine how they want to reach that goal. So this is uh, part of that uh, supporting, giving members a chance to determine time, task, team, and technique supports in the development of autonomy, which is key in that. So thank you all for participating and and I will we'll move on to the next section. Thank you. All right. Thanks for that, Bethany. Um, so now we're going to come back to this idea of burnout and see how what we've just been discussing about motivation might be able to help. So you may be wondering, you know, is there anything that we can do in our roles um, as leaders in the VISTA program, um, anything we can do to prevent burnout? So the good news is that that individuals who have already have some strong intrinsic motivation that aligns with their work, um, they are less likely to experience burnout. So thinking about Pink's three-part model, people are less likely to experience burnout when their work allows for self-determination, that is autonomy, it's well-suited to their abilities or their mastery, and it is aligned with their personal goals or their purpose. There's also a social or a community aspect to burnout. So, of course, there's been a lot of research done. Um, and social scientists identified certain cooperative behaviors, things like altruism, courtesy, sportsmanship, and conscientiousness. There's a whole long list of them. Um, anyway, these, these type of cooperative behaviors tend to reduce burnout. And interestingly, it's individuals who practice these cooperative behaviors, they are less likely to experience burnout, and those who are on the team, even if they're not doing those cooperative things, but just being on a team that have a higher level of cooperative behavior among their coworkers, they're also less likely to burn out. So what does this mean for leaders? Well, keep doing what you can to support your members in those three areas of motivation. And in addition, to create some inclusive team culture that gives your members a sense of belonging. And continue to check in with them individually to see how they're doing and to look for warning signs along the way. Okay, we're going to take a few seconds here to um, put one more chat question out there. So what are some examples of cooperative behaviors to, that you see within your team? So taking a moment to think about your own team worksite or, or members, what are things that you do that are cooperative behaviors that others might be able to learn from? Oh, group garden, garden project we have. Providing feedback to each other on a project. So that can be um, sort of assessing how something went or, um, you know, various types of feedback where you can um, hear, hear from others and um, get those perspectives. Supporting other team members in their work endeavors. Yep, there's a variety of ways you can support people, each other, encouraging. These are great, Andy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think um, you know all these are, are great, uh, great examples, and and really, it's just um, you know kind of creating that culture. I think I think the sum of these is to um, just creating an environment where 
uh, people do little nice things for each other or for the team, and that that sort of has a uh, um, a, a positive growth uh, aspect to it. And, and once it gets started, um, it can really build. So, um, so keep these great ideas coming. Um, you know, things around communication and connecting with partners. Um, all of this um, are great. <clears throat> Um, but we need to move on. We just want to leave you with um, uh, today with some ways that you can sort of, to sort of sum up what we've been talking about here. Um, and I want to suggest these four guiding principles that um, may help you support intrinsic motivation in yourself as well as in others. Uh, for team leaders and uh, colleagues who want to help others feel included, Serving as a fair-minded ally, that is, someone who treats everyone equally, can offer protection to buffer um, any potential exclusionary behavior of others. Leaders have the ability to create an open and approachable team environment. Next, it's essential to know our members as individuals, which means knowing about them as people, not just as the activities on their VAD. Knowing more about your members not only builds a stronger team, but helps you support them in staying motivated. We talked about the importance of trusting that your members want to do the right things and believing that they have the skills to do it. And this last principle relates to all of those lack of factors that can demotivate people. Um, and this one actually might be bigger than what you can do in your role. But ask yourself, which of the reasons for demotivation are you seeing in the environment? And is there anything that you can do about it? In some cases, you might be able to provide your members with the right resources, guidance, or instruction. But we realize that there are many things that you do not have control over. And for those situations, you can advocate to improve the environment for the team. Thank you, Andy. Um, so before everyone takes off today, we'd love to hear your feedback about today's webinar. So um, there's a brief survey that's been posted in the chat, and it also um, may be uh, popped up in, in your browser and um, one of the tabs. So uh, I want to say thanks to uh, Andy and Shannon for a very informative presentation. And um, we would like you to fill out the survey in the browser and um, and in Zoom, if it's not available, one more thing, if it's not available in the chat, it, uh, it'll it be in your browser window, like I mentioned. So, um, and we're going to take, uh, see about the next, we're going to go to some questions. Um, we had a few during, during the session that we'll search back to. So um, early on, we had a question about the, the research about um, employees sort of early in the about motivation and uh, someone asked if there that was about general employees or just in particular that particular research was based on that and um, the I don't know Andy if you you and I both looked at this it was mm -hmm. not this is specific but right um, right and, uh, the, yeah. the stuff that we've been working from is, is more general research on uh, employees typically paid employees in the workplace there's you know so much more resource and, and research there so, so that's what our, our sessions were built on what I've tried to do is to highlight um, you know techniques or approaches that seem relevant for the Vista situation and those are the ones that I talked about here Yep. I also Great. saw there was a question um, that said, how do we work with burned out vistas? Um, and so I don't know if the, the little piece I did right there near the end was helpful. Um, but uh, of course, you know, one of the things would be to look at, you know, what is the source of the burnout? What's causing it? Right. And and just from the basic um, understanding or definition of it, you know, it's, it's generally stress that's caused. Um, either by you know, too much work or uh, lack of support. So it's looking to see you know, what are the contributing elements there and to see what can be done to help mitigate those, right? So does the person need a break? Is there an imbalance in workload? Are they, you know, there unrealistic expectations 
you know, so maybe too much on the workload side, maybe not enough on the support side. So um, look to see what could be missing there or, or what maybe you as a leader could do or, or maybe there's something for other people on the team. Maybe um, other members could help um, support or maybe the supervisor has a role or, or maybe someone else um, has some, some way that they could contribute there. Um, and then, uh, and then look back also to that community dimension, right? Having those cooperative behaviors. So, um, you know, are there ways to encourage the whole team to be more supportive of each other? And that would benefit not only the indiv the one individual, um, but but the whole team as well. Um, we didn't really have a lot of time to go in detail here. One thing that stood out though from the um, the research on burnout, it's much easier to prevent than it is to bring somebody back from it. So, um, so I'll just mention that as well. Um, we had another question that said, how do you encourage young members, meaning like age 22 years old, how do you encourage them to be more active? Um, and here, I guess I would say, uh, I, I don't want to generalize about 22-year-olds um, overall, and I don't know if it's particularly their age um, that is, is the, the source of it um, or something else. So I would say, um, you know, focus on that principle of getting to know them as individuals um, and see, you know, what's going on with them and, and give them that opportunity. And, and maybe it can happen in the context of a team meeting to um, – to learn about what motivates them and see if you can um, home in on that and get them to really focus in on their motivation and then connect with that and try to connect their motivation and, and turn that into action. So um, uh, I know that's not a, a much of an answer, but um, we will um, need to leave it there. We are um, at the top of the hour, so I'm going to um, turn it back to Bethany to, to wrap us up. Yeah, great. Thank you. So we um, our next webinar for leaders on assess, is on assessing professional development needs, and it will take place in um, April on the 21st at 2 p.m. Uh, same time as today. And so we hope to see you at that webinar. Um, our, uh, I want to thank our presenters, Andy King um, and Shannon Tucker, for a very informative presentation and um, guest speaker role. Um, thank you also to our, our production team, Steve, Gray, and Kim, um, and others behind the scenes that make this presentation accessible. Um, and possible. So thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you again in the future.